Hello, and a very warm welcome on behalf of the IMF to everyone who's tuning in to this virtual event today. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce the closing session of this year's Statistical Forum, which covered the theme of measuring climate change, the economic and financial dimensions. Our final session today promises to be both educational and thought-provoking. It starts with a presentation by our esteemed guest professor, Professor Johan Rockström, and he will be speaking on the post-pandemic climate challenge, holding the 1.5 degree centigrade line. And this will be followed by a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva. Professor Rockström is director of Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and professor in Earth System Science at the University of Potsdam. He is, of course, an internationally recognized scientist for his work on global sustainability. He has helped lead a team of scientists that developed the Planetary Boundaries Framework for a Safe Operating Space for Humanity. His work was featured in a recent Netflix documentary, and if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. It's very relevant to the central topic of our forum on the use of data for a greener future. And there's more to his environmental resume. Johan Rockström has published more than 150 research articles, including in Science and Nature. His books and book chapters are far too numerous to cite. Beyond his impressive academic work, he finds time to act as an advisor for sustainable development issues for governments and business networks, as well as for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conferences, also known as COP, which, as many of you know, closed their summit in Glasgow only a few days ago. He is also a regular speaker at the World Economic Forum in Davos and an influential TED speaker on global sustainability issues. Looking forward to hearing from Johan in just a second. As I mentioned, his keynote speech will be followed by a discussion with Kristalina Georgieva. Kristalina, of course, is our managing director here at the fund. And what you may not know, she began her career as an environmental economist. And her vision to put climate change at the center of the IMF's macro critical work has been well articulated in the lead up to COP26. To quote Kristalina, how we address climate change matters in reducing risks to people and economies. It also matters because it creates opportunities for green growth and green jobs. With that, it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to Professor Rockstrom for his keynote speech, after which we will have the discussion with uh, Kristalina and Johan. Professor Rockstrom, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much and uh, it's great to be with you. I, I think it's correct to state that never before coming out of Glasgow have we had such a large urgent need to have good data to be able to really keep the world accountable for all the decisions and all the pledges and all the major transformative and accelerated efforts we now need to see in the journey towards a safe climate future. Now, I hope you can, my screen really misbehaved a bit. Can, can you see, you, but I don't think uh, I've shared my screen, have I? No, exactly. Let me see. I'm trying to. There we are. So there we are. Perfect. Good. So what I'd like to do over the next uh, 20 minutes is, uh, well, to begin with, as an entry point to say that uh, my own scientific passion is really about quantitative scientific targets for a prosperous, equitable transformation for humanity within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. This is really about a safe landing within a manageable climate system. It is an equitable journey for all future generations within a planet that remains in an interglacial state.
that we know has supported humanity for the past 12,000 years. It's about advancing the science that Kristalina Georgieva has been so instrumental in supporting on defining a planetary health diet, which is also about quantifications. All of this boils down to quantifications to guide humanity's future. And I think this is absolutely necessary. Glasgow is not an exception. We can say scientifically that we came to Glasgow on a path to disaster. We were following a 2.7 degrees Celsius pathway, a place we haven't been in for the past 3 million, actually 4 million years. We leave Glasgow on a path to danger, a pathway that if all the pledges are delivered upon, if all the indices are delivered upon, the updated ones, if all the net zero pathways are also delivered upon, we could, with a 50% probability level, reach a stabilization of 1.9 degrees Celsius. For the first time, we're actually edging below 2 degrees Celsius. But a path to danger is not a path to a manageable future, so we still need the momentum and ramping up and scientifically aligning all the world's NDCs and all the net zero pathways and all the investments in nature-based solutions with science. And that's where statistics come up, and that is where it's so important to see the days ahead and the years ahead as fundamental in ramping up the pace of change. The kind of reactions to COP26 were mixed, as we all know, and I certainly agree with that assessment. Significant progress, the rule book is closed, but we still have a lot to do to really, really ensure that the window of 1.5, which is open, but barely, barely open, can still be kept alive. Now, what I find really remarkable with COP26 compared to, if not all, at least most COP meetings, I would argue all COP meetings, is that we're no longer battling over the direction of travel. We have all countries in the world swimming along the same swimming lanes. The difference is that we're debating the speed of transition, but the target is set towards delivering on the Paris Agreement. That is really significant. When, when India put the spanner in the wheel one minute to midnight in the end of the Glasgow negotiations, that was often portrayed by many as, as a form of obstruction. Well, it wasn't an obstruction. It was rather a nation that two days before had put forward a pledge of 50% reduction of um, a fossil fuel-based electricity provision by 2030 and a net zero pathway to 2070. And then realizing that pledging to phase out fossil fuels and all subsidies to coal is a very challenging step for a nation that has 70% of its electricity for all low-income households originating from coal. Of course, one has to recognize that this is very challenging. So the debates in Glasgow were really debates over the pace of change, not the debates of whether we were together on a collective journey towards a safe climate future or not. The Glasgow Key Achievements are many. You're so well aware of them. I'd just like to point to the fact that outside of the rule book, outside of the NDCs, we have these significant alliances of countries for change. The methane commitment, gathering two-thirds of the global economies, 100 countries committing to halt deforestation by 2030, which is 85% of forests on planet Earth, the coal phase-out initiative, which of course it lacks still Australia, India, China, the US, but a significant group, so large in fact, that many, I think quite rightly, pointed out that after Glasgow, we are seeing the death bell on coal starting to ring. The 90% emissions now being connected to net zero pathways. This is significant, not least because the four biggest emitters, China, US, the European Union, and India, have actually aligned behind net zero pathway. What is so interesting with all these pledges, which is also a significant uh, progress to, compared to other COP meetings, is that they're all quantified. They're all numbered. We can map them. One way of mapping them is just to show the remarkable journey we have ahead. Here is just outlining what net zero pathway actually means coming out of Glasgow for China, US, the European Union, India, Russia, Indonesia. I've just put in the Indian plan here. Of course, 2070 is 20 years too late from a scientific perspective to stay within the global carbon budget of 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide. We need to follow the carbon law of cutting emissions by half every decade and have net zero by 2050. But just look at the pace of change. 
just look at China's journey. Of course, these are quantitative, but also very, very socioeconomically challenging pathways. And we know that this is just one part of the story. The phase out of fossil fuels, according to carbon law, the gray part here, is one massive challenge, but it won't take us to the safe landing. The safe landing in 1.5 requires also the transformation of the global food system. The brown wedge here, single largest emitter of greenhouse gases, up to 25%, in some studies even up to 37%, must transition in all IPCC models that can actually take us to 1.5 within the remaining carbon budget, requires that the food system transitions in orange to become a large, the single largest carbon sink by the second half of this century. But not only that has to happen, we also need to maintain the carbon sinks in nature on land in green and in oceans in blue. And it's only then, together with scaling of CCS and negative emission technologies shown here in yellow, that we actually have a two thirds chance of landing the Paris 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. So the journey ahead is really about transitioning back within planetary boundaries. It is about staying within quantified science-based targets, not only for carbon and the carbon budget, but also for the logical cycle, for the nitrogen cycle, for the phosphorus cycle, for land expansion, and for biodiversity. And that is what is now starting to be recognized. I find that, that to be perhaps the most encouraging outcome of Glasgow is that the UK government really managed to get nature-based solutions, nature climate investments, the whole voluntary carbon markets to really become a key integral element of the climate policies moving forward. And of course we need it because the sixth assessment of the IPCC, Working Group 1, concludes you know, with more scientific confidence levels than ever before. This table is just one reminder. Seven years ago in the AR5, we had 100 medium to very high confidence statements. Now we have 180, almost twice as many scientifically high confidence statements. This just shows that science is advancing so fast on quantifying and giving you know, better precision on the challenges we're facing ahead. We summarized this in the 10 new insights in climate science. We do this each year and hand them over to the climate negotiators. This was done to Patricia Spinoza in Glasgow. And again, this gives a number of elements, not only in the physical sciences, but also in the social sciences, about the need to quantify the equity dimensions of how to share the remaining carbon space in a fair way. You know the statistics here, that the you know, richest 1% of citizens on Earth must reduce their per capita emissions with a factor 30, while 50% of the poorest in the world can actually increase their emissions with a factor three in order to have a safe but also an equitable sharing of the remaining carbon budget. So these are kind of scientific statistics that are increasingly also, you know, advancing in the attribution science. You've seen in the AR6 not only how the uh, severity of extreme events are increasing, but also the frequency and that the attribution to humans are actually very clear. But post IPC6 assessment comes the summer of 2021. And here you remember the 49.6 degrees Celsius in Lytton, British Columbia, not an extreme event, what I would call so far away in number of standard deviations away from the average, that this is a super extreme with tremendous immediate impacts on humans. Lytton town actually burned down two weeks after this heat wave because of the drought it caused. But the big scientific question, of course, is why did this happen? Was it a freak event? Or could it be that it actually is connected to a cascade of the slowdown of the jet stream? Because the jet stream that normally in the left picture here has a thermodynamic, really uh, high speed river of wind from west to the east, 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere, pushed forward by the warm air from the equator and the cold air in the Arctic, pushing high low pressure systems from west to east. When the Arctic is melting so fast with warmer atmosphere, it slows down this thermodynamic engine. The whole jet stream starts meandering, locking in high low pressure systems, causing these kind of blockages that we see more and more documented, both when it comes to the disaster in Lytton, 
but also could explain the catastrophic floods in Germany and the Netherlands and Belgium this summer, and can also explain the heat wave in Europe in 2018, but also the extreme winter conditions in 2017 in the US. This is the new reality. 1.1 degrees Celsius warming causes extreme events. But at the same time, we get exponential uh, uh, and amplified warming and melting of Greenland and the Arctic, impacting on the jet stream, feeding back on weather systems, amplifying the extreme events. These kind of cascades is something that increasingly scientifically are also verified. Here you just see the trajectory and direction of travel of science. What you have here is 20 years of IPCC advancements, the famous red embers diagrams of quantified risk assessment. The redder the color, the higher the confidence of risk. You see on the x-axis here, global mean temperature rise from zero to six degrees. 20 years ago, in the third assessment, it was assessed that large scale discontinuities, crossing tipping points, were at risk at potentially up at five, six degrees Celsius warming. You see the red color in the lowest bar here. Look at how this red hue goes down, down, down in temperature as we move towards the third and then the fourth and then the 1.5 degrees Celsius report. Today, we are actually having scientific evidence that the risk uh, landscape is down around the two degrees Celsius point. So this is why science is starting to warn so much about a global crisis. But it's not only that. IPCC now also confirms the irreversibility commitments that we are facing, that even if we land at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, we have a high likelihood of committing all future generations to at least two meters sea level rise. This is irreversible. It will go slowly. It may take 2,000 years, but it is unstoppable. This is the new dimension also of what we need quantifications to do, not only quantify immediate impacts, but also irreversible commitments. But also the frontier of science, and I just want to point you at this, is not only about quantifying tipping points and tipping element systems, nine of them shown here in these yellow dots, big biophysical systems that we have scientific evidence that they regulate the state of the climate system and that they have tipping points. They can flip from one state, a rainforest, to another state, a savanna state. But also they have more and more evidence of arrows in between them the cascades I mentioned earlier here between the Greenland ice sheet and the jet stream. But you also have interactions between the Arctic and Greenland and the slowdown of the Atlantic overturning of heat, which in turn can push down the monsoon system further south and impact on droughts and forest fires over the Amazon rainforest. But it can also lead to holding more warm surface water in the Southern Ocean, which can explain accelerated melting of the West Antarctic ice shelf. These interactive cascades between systems in the Earth system have to be understood. And science is increasing on top of this. The IPCC maps out the slowdown of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, says that it's very likely to decline, it's medium com confidence regarding abrupt change, but we cannot rule out abrupt change. And there are scientific papers out there showing that a shutdown cannot be excluded. Same goes with melting in West Antarctic and Greenland. We can no longer um, just exclude that we can have irreversible melting even in the bracket between two and three degrees Celsius. So the IPCC lists now, even if it's low probability, high impact, there are now tipping points that cannot be ruled out in the Earth system and these are now quantified in a way that we haven't seen before. So now I think is the first time that we truly have to, you know, add up the numbers up to the planetary scale. Are we at risk of destabilizing the entire Earth system and its ability to support human development? And there is science that is kind of putting this in, in a very, let's say, significant perspective. This is the first time a climate model is able to reproduce the journey of planet Earth over the past three million years. So you have three million years on the x-axis and global mean temperature on the y-axis. The zero point is the pre-industrial 14 degrees Celsius. And I just point you direct to the green line here, which is the model simulation. And as you see, the planet has gone, you know, up and down and up and down, deep ice age, up and warm into glacials, oscillating deeper and deeper over the past one million years to the furthest right. And, and that is in, in one sense, a remarkable quantitative feat to now be able to mathematically reproduce the journey of planet Earth over this entire period, driven predominantly by 
solar, uh, the orbital forcing of the sun during Earth's journey around the sun, but also extreme events of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and, and, and over the last period, you see the little red dot here when we humans take over on the forcing. But the key message with this graph is the remarkable scientific understanding today that during this entire period, which is the only period, by the way, that planet Earth has been basically biophysically composed as the Earth we know today, we've never been, as far as we understand today, beyond two degrees. The planet has in its warmest state been under two degrees and minus four and you're in a deep ice age. So the corridor of life for us humans, because we have only been around on planet Earth over the really last patch of this journey, the last 200,000 years or so, are dependent of staying within this narrow corridor. So, you know, staying below two has really deep, deep scientific meaning today. The IPCC confirms this by concluding that over the last 100,000 years, we've actually never been above one degree. And now we are at 1.1. So we are really in a danger zone. But not only that, why has the planet stayed within such a narrow corridor of life? Well, it's not only because the solar orbital forcing has been so gentle to planet Earth. Oh no, it's rather been quite stressful, but at the same time, the resilience among the planetary boundary systems is so remarkably high that it's been able to dampen and cool the planet. The IPCC concludes this by the number 56% of human emissions of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning has been absorbed in oceans and on land, the world's largest subsidy to the world economy. And we know that the more we have emitted in greenhouse gases, the hockey stick of emissions shown above the zero line here from 1850 until today, it's not all of this that has added up in the atmosphere causing 1.1 degrees Celsius. Oh no, there is this dark green wedge that is absorption of carbon dioxide in the ocean, 25%, and another 25% of absorption on land. So it's only the blue residual here that has caused the 1.1 degrees Celsius warming so far. So that's one insight, but look at the graph. The more we stress the Earth system, the more the Earth system in a healthy state helps us by increasing its absorption of carbon dioxide. This is a proof that with a healthy planet, it is remaining within the, the corridor of life by buffering and dampening stress coming externally in geolo geological time and now from us humans. And of course, the nervousness is we're starting to see more and more signs like this in the left showing a phenomenally important study that the Brazilian part of the Amazon has over the last 10 years, according to this analysis, already flipped over from sink to source. And we published quite recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a quantification running a climate model showing that the nature carbon sinks in intact ecosystems on land is what we have to thank for not having passed through 1.5 degrees Celsius already today. So one, 0 0.4 degrees Celsius of cooling has been the benefit from, from uh, the dampening efforts on land and the ocean has contributed with even more. So that is why coming out of Glasgow, it's not only about the energy transition, it's really about exponential transformations back into a safe operating space. But it's encouraging to see the efforts made, for example, here from the exponential roadmap initiative, of, of mapping quantitatively, sector by sector, the solution space on existing technologies, showing that it is actually possible to cut emissions by half by 2030 in sector by sector, economy by economy, to move us towards that net zero point that we have to come to. And that investments are starting to align with this, as you know better than anyone. I mean, you play such an incredibly important role as, as the fund to support, not least, Mark Carney's efforts of aligning financial assets across the world with 1.5 degrees Celsius investments. And I think we can today also turn another quantitative corner, apart from the risk analysis, that we have the solutions, that finance is starting to ramp up, but also that citizens around the world are really, really starting to understand this. As you know, the Yale University uh, with uh, my dear friend and colleagues, Tony Lizarovitz, do every year these opinion polls showing that 60, 70 percent of citizens around the world are really concerned about climate change. We recently did a similar opinion poll on all the G20 countries run by Ipsos, where we asked for the first time the question about, are you concerned of risks of crossing tipping points? And we were ourselves shocked over the numbers. 
73% of citizens across all G20 countries are really concerned over the risks of pushing the Earth system too far. So there is such a, such a strong uh, kind of embedded support for action towards transitioning back to a safe space. And we know that the quantifications is not only about 1.5 degrees Celsius. We see more and more efforts on science-based targets on all planetary boundaries. And as you may know, the current work on the CBD COP15 on biodiversity is considering the following graph. This is from the sub-study, science-based technical committee of the CBD on, on having a quantitative biodiversity global target of net zero loss of nature intact ecosystem from 2020 resurfacing on a net positive after restoration and regeneration quantifications by 2030 and move towards full recovery by 2050. So quantifications and statistics, I think is, is the melody of the day to keep ourselves on an accelerated track. Can we succeed? Well, I think one of the most encouraging outcomes from Glasgow is the G3 for climate. I mean, this is not officially proclaimed. This is, let's say, our informal idea among some scientists that the US, European Union, and China are now aligning behind quantitative net zero pathways. These are the three largest economic regions. What if they could you know, really align themselves on, on, on accounting, monitoring, and really investing towards a transition? Could that be the moment of us ultimately you know, crossing the social tipping point and running towards an inevitable, unstoppable journey towards that fair and prosperous net zero future on a manageable planet that we all require. With that, back to you and looking forward to the discussion together, uh, Kristalina. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Bravo. That was a fantastic uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, what I like about it is that it creates that sense we can do it. We can move uh, towards uh, net zero, and uh, we can successfully transform our economies. Uh, I, uh, I know that uh, you love data, and you know how to translate data into messages that impact behavior and policies, and this is what we would be talking uh, now. Uh, let me start with... Uh, the Netflix, uh, uh, Netflix documentary that uh, uh, my colleague uh, Jerry Rice mentioned. What impressed me was uh, you talked about some of your early exposure to climate change data. Uh, collection of soil samples, wind speed, rainfall data in Africa, and you did it for your PhD uh, research. Uh, that reminds me in my own PhD research uh, looking into data on economic incentives to change behavior. In, in that case, I was uh, uh, doing my research on sulfur. How can we bring sulfur uh, down in a most efficient way? So my question to you is, throughout your professional life, what are the most important developments in collecting data and relying on data that have changed significantly how the world understands climate change and sustainability. Where did you see up to now the critical advancements in uh, science and data that have made it possible today to have this very informed conversation? Yeah, no, no thanks. Uh, thanks, Christina. That, that's a really, really important question. and. Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd like to, perhaps as one candidate to to that advancements in, in where data has really played an important role in our insights. I think it is in 2007 when the International Geosphere Biosphere Program published for the first time all the hockey sticks, you know, not only the carbon dioxide mm -hmm. hockey stick, but the hockey stick on, on sulfates on nitrogen, on biodiversity loss, on freshwater use, on land degradation, on deforestation, on all the parameters that became the proof, the evidence point that, that took us to the conclusion that we've entered the Anthropocene, that we are now you know, leaving the Holocene and have become our own geological epoch. So data 
observations in the real world in the Earth system uh, laid the foundation to what I think is the most important kind of message from science over the past decades that we are now in the Anthropocene. So I think that that would be one one candidate, and that came from you know the Keeling curve and 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 all the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment work, the Global Energy Assessment work, and so on. The the second really uh, significant kind of data point that I find, uh, which was really at the frontier right now, is is how we are seeing more and more Earth observation and mm. big data being used in, in machine learning methodologies. We're developing many big data methodologies to to explore what's happening with the big complex systems like like the monsoon systems and the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic and uh, and the ice sheet dynamics, because we have more and more evidence that when a system approaches a tipping point, it, it tends to either slow down or create more variability. So, so data really matters here, but the only way to do this is by having really big, big data sets. Mm. And, and, so, and, and with computer power today, we, we, can, we can do that. But finally, I think from a policy perspective, what we're able to do with satellites and translating mm. that, for example, I think, for example, the Global Forest Watch yep. and the ability to basically monitor at real time every single tree on planet Earth is, um, is, is fantastic. I mean, it's just, uh, it just gives us tools to, uh, to, to, to become stewards, truly stewards of, of the Earth system. Uh, wonderful uh, points. Uh, Jochen, one of the um, themes that are coming through this statistical forum is the importance of taxonomy for data that we, we now risk to be in a situation in which different segments of society collect and rely on data, but they are not well needed for decision makers. Uh, what is the solution to this problem? How do you see us moving in a more uh, comprehensive way so different data sets talk to each other and what concerns us they talk to economists and our data sets can be connected to those uh, that you described are based on uh, earth observation so we have a holistic way of integrating different types of data yeah, no, I will. I, I think you're putting your finger on, uh, on 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 a big challenge, actually. And and I and I would, I would argue that that we in the scientific community have a responsibility, actually, to try and mm -hmm. and respond, rise to to that challenge, because mm -hmm. we also know, uh, which is of course positive, but it's also quite chaotic that we are overloaded with data mm -hmm. and and we barely know how to manage it. And I think we're making most progress on on the let's say the natural science side on all the environmental parameters but but what really really matters is to get the human dimensions the mm. social parameters to integrate with the biophysical parameters and how to do that in a relevant way for decision making i mean this is this is a tremendous challenge and not only that i think what what you're also touching on is the fact that we need to have transparency mm -hmm. we have to have trust which means that we cannot have just, just kind of monolithic providers of, of data. I think one of the most reassuring and one reasons why we have come so far on the climate science is actually that today it's not one source uh, delivering the temperature estimates on planet Earth that we have reached 1.1 de degrees of global warming. Oh no, it's, it's, uh, there is uh, you know stations in the US, in the UK, in China, in Japan, the European Union set of, of uh, uh, providers, many independent sources all synthesized together. So you have this kind of meta levels of, mm -hmm. of uh, primary data gathered together quite, I mean, quite chaotically until it reaches the pinnacle of something that can be served to, um, to decision makers and, mm -hmm. and heads of IMF, for example. So yeah. I think we need to perhaps um, accept a certain level of, um, yeah, call it chaos or, or uh, uh, messiness mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in order to 
be sure that we're able to to generate the most credible credible conclusions and that's why i think that the methodologies that are now developed for example on systemic reviews we mm -hmm. use computer power to to run systemic reviews of scientific literature or systemic reviews of big data sets to be able to draw out in a very objective way what have we learned what 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 is actually the conclusions and what are the confidence intervals so i, I know this was not a very satisfying answer because as i i, I end where i where i started i think you point your finger on a on one of the big challenges we have I think it would be the outcome of this conference uh, to mobilize us to address this challenge and uh, uh, that yes. on its own is uh, a, a huge uh, success because when you know what is the problem you need to solve, never mind how complex the problem may be, your chances are uh, immediately much better. At the fund, uh, we are now determined to play our role uh, on integrating climate data with macroeconomic data and with data on uh, financial performance. We launched, uh, we call it Climate Change Indicators Dashboard, and I want to praise uh, the team in our statistics department uh, uh, for being so creative and reaching out to partners like OECD, the World Bank, UN, European Commission. It gathers and disseminates data on economic and financial implications of climate change, uh, and I would urge you to uh, take us under your wing uh, to, to give us your view on whether the way we are integrating this data works. Uh, why it is so important? Uh, because we know that uh, economic uh, and finance policy makers tend to think more short term and when we are addressing the challenge of climate change we have to take a long view uh, perspective as you have shown in the in the graphs uh, so I think it is now the moment to to wrestle with this this uh, problem for two reasons one is for quality of policies based on good data uh, but also because of accountability for results and that takes me to my so so my first me first message Jochen is please help us to do this really well uh, you your network uh, you are so fantastic uh, I know that we would, would benefit tremendously uh, to be in one family. But then the, se the, the second issue, it, it, it is a question to you. When we came out of uh, Glasgow, I share your assessment that uh, a lot has moved uh, on deforestation, on methane, on coal phase out, uh, on the financing of climate action but we got much more uh, enthusiastic pledges towards the middle of the century. So we do have governments and private sector committing to not net zero by 2050, in some cases 2060, you pointed to India 2070. When we look at the decade that will be decisive, this decade, the pledges are not as impressive as they ought to be. Our own judgment is that even if all pledges are implemented, we would get only one third to two thirds of the emission reduction necessary to happen in this decade. So from accountability perspective, what do you think we need to zero in on in this decade? What are the, the measures that we have to get policymakers concentrate on? Yeah, no, of course, I, I, I fully agree with you. And as you may know, we put out actually a, a paper already a, a few years back mm -hmm. uh, launching what we call the carbon law. And the carbon law is a very simple law inspired by the Moore's law, by the way, that to mm -hmm. follow the scientific pathway to hold ourselves within the 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget requires cutting emissions by half every decade. Yes. So if you, if you, instead of doubling the speed of computers every 18 months as an innovation pathway, you can have a transformation pathway aligned with science, which is this decade is about a 50% reduction mm -hmm. of global emissions, which of course means that rich nations have to go 
faster than that because many of the developing countries will will per necessity move slightly slower so so I, I agree with you and and as you know moving from 2021 to 2030 on a, on a 50 percent reduction pathway is translates to roughly six seven percent mm -hmm. emission reductions per year so mm -hmm. so we have we have the path already set for 2022 and 2023 we need to bend the curve and follow very quantitative targets at an annual and a decadal way but it's it's even as you know even more complicated than that that we tend to see companies and countries to to blur this up a little bit uh, in the sense that even even i mean problem number one as you point out there aren't quantitative targets enough for 2030 mm -hmm. problem number two even if you have them they tend to be a little bit too wish-washy with uh, offsetting and net mm -hmm. zero and uh, emission reductions uh, to 15 20 percent being allowed to be offset mm -hmm. outside of the national border or outside mm -hmm. of a company and then you tend to then uh, do that by accounting for afforestation or conservation efforts that have already been factored into mm -hmm. the climate models giving us the carbon budget in the first place yep. so so scientifically we have to kind of separate these buckets very clearly what is maintaining carbon sinks in intact mm -hmm. ecosystems what is the food system transition and what is the fossil fuel mitigation pathway so you're right we we need both quantifications on the short term but also keep a, a very very careful track mm. on the numbers across all sectors so that is uh, mm. that's why i'm so enthusiastic when you shared your 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 efforts at the fund mm. to really have a combination of climate impacts with economy yep. because in the end uh, as of course i have, don't have to say in, in this audience that what will drive us forward is is the economic incentives and and the economic outcomes so if i may mm -hmm. a question back to you kristalina would be are you um considering in this climate economics integration to also look at at the other way around namely what are the economic benefits mm -hmm. for human well-being but also for economic development from climate action because i think what the world now needs to see is also that this makes sense, mm. that we actually can can gain and we can win-win outcomes from investments. I'm curious to hear if, if, if I may, your your thinking also on the let's say on on the positive, the positive outcomes of, uh, a zero, of zero carbon transition. We definitely look into that, and we believe very strongly that uh, only by presenting the risks, the costs, and the potential benefits, we can move fast enough uh, decision makers, the private sector, and us people, households, in the right direction. Uh, we have done a very interesting study on what is likely to happen with a big green investment push. And uh, not very different from the analysis of the uh, new climate economy. What we came up was in the initial years, costs may be higher than the benefits for growth and jobs. But over time, that changes quite dramatically. And on average, we would get 0.7% uh, boost to growth and some 15 to 30 million green jobs just by pushing the uh, climate uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation for that matter uh, faster using public money to change dynamics also for private sector participation. We are going to continue with this work. We actually, the most inter interesting thing we do at the fund is to integrate climate in our annual assessments of the economic well-being of countries. Uh, the fund is unique because we had that mandate to work with all countries, rich, poor, to look at how well they perform. And now that this is called on, on our technical uh, jargon, Article 4 consultations. Now we integrate mitigation uh, policies in uh, high emitter countries, adaptation policies in very vulnerable countries, and of course, transition policies for countries that are currently dependent on hydrocarbon uh, for their economies. And that on its own is 
so much changing mindsets as to what we talk about with ministers of finance, with central bankers, with our traditional uh, community. Uh, it is more powerful than even the financing the IMF can provide because it goes to the heart of the matter. What is good for people, for the planet, for our future? Uh, and I would finish by saying uh, that uh, at the IMF, we recognize uh, that translating climate-related financial stability risks into measurable assessments. Uh, we, we do financial sector assessments. Blending this in has tremendous value for decision makers and for changing the course of, uh, of the economy. Uh, and now going back to you, what do you want us to do more? If you were to be uh, my boss for the next 15 minutes, what is my uh, boss asking from me? <laughs> well, I would never qualify to come close to your chair, Kristalina, so I feel very secure on my side here. But, um, but of course, it's a, it's a very challenging thought. Well, I mean, it, it, it will come as no surprise to say that, um, you know, based on all the evidence we have, but inspired not least in, in the way you, 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 you describe the direction of travel that you're on, I mean, what, what the world needs to see is, of course, that, that all, all financial investments, all mm -hmm. economic support for development is now going, you know, entirely mm -hmm. to clean, healthy, sustainable investments, <clears throat> meaning that we have to leave behind 100 percent. It, it cannot be, um, you know, it, it cannot be compromised with when it comes to uh, investments in, in coal, oil, and natural gas, mm -hmm. and all types of practices that, uh, that undermine the stability of, of, of the functioning of the Earth system. So I think mm -hmm. that, that is, of, of course, a number one. And, and I think what this can, with actors like IMF, mm -hmm. be combined with is your, as you say, I mean, you're, you're kind of a multiplier institution. It's, it's mm -hmm. one thing the volumes of, uh, of economic space that you sit with yourself, but you're also such a recognized global common public good. Mm -hmm. you, you are, uh, so I, if, if I was were sitting in your chair, I would spend mm -hmm. a lot of time in trying to communicate the statistics, mm -hmm. the evidence yes. of both risks and costs with risks, but also benefits of mm -hmm. investing in, in the right direction. Because in the end, we need that confidence to be spread uh, across the world in a very, very rapid pace. I think what the world needs more than ever is not only the positive narrative, but the proof, mm -hmm. the proof that we can you know, solve this crisis and have mm -hmm. a better outcome in the other end. And I would put a lot of effort in that actually, and try to multiply that, that, that story and thereby have alliances with mm -hmm. other, you know, providers of, um, of, of, economic support for development in the world. I mean, you are, as you say, you're, you're, you're one among many institutions kind of that need to align now for the same, for the same transition. Well, message received, boss. Um, the way I take it is uh, to mean that uh, we operate as systemically significant institution in the transformation of the world economy towards low carbon climate resilient future. And uh, I, I can tell you that I will pass this message to my colleagues and I know many of them uh, embrace it wholeheartedly. Let me, let me go to a, uh, to a, a question that uh, uh, when, I, when I watched the, uh, the graphs uh, uh, jumped uh, to me. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a simple answer to what we should be zeroing in on in this decade which, as you said, is the uh, carbon balance. And what you presented uh, is the incredible role of a healthy planet, healthy ecosystems, to help us in this journey to 1.5 degree only temperature increase. 
Uh, and uh, when, I, when, when you presented it, of course, uh, uh, you put some very uh, troubling uh, studies, uh, especially this one, the one on Brazil, Brazil turning into net contributor to carbon emissions, the, the Amazon rather than a sink. Uh, when, you were, when you were listening to the discussions in Glasgow, did you get a sense that we are finally reaching that point that we recognize fully the no enormous role of ecosystems help? You praised the UK for, for doing that, but did you get a sense that now we are going to move to uh, monetize the benefits of ecosystems, make sure that this monetization influences decision makers uh, significantly, that the concept of offsets is now truly and entirely embraced with no greenwashing, that we are going to go that way. What was the, I mean, I have been working for, for the uh, uh, recognition of, eco uh, of uh, eco um, ecosystem services for many, many years. Uh, and it has always bothered me that somehow it, it stays on the periphery. Is it now center stage? Yeah, no, so, so I realize if, if, if I got a chance to, 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 to spend some little extra time next to you in your office, mm -hmm. I would say that, yes, th th this is definitely what would be really top of my, on my work agenda to, to, to really put monetary value on mm -hmm. natural assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've come a long way, not far enough, but we've come a long way on mm -hmm. carbon, but we urgently need to put economic value also on all other functions mm -hmm. in nature, which is not only carbon sinks, but yeah. also the resilience of, of mm -hmm. ecosystems and, and the stability of mm -hmm. water supply, food supply, mm -hmm. air quality, you know, all the fundamentals. So you're absolutely right. And uh, did, did, did COP26 achieve this? Well, there's no doubt that COP26 turned a corner and is mm. the first COP meeting where, where nature and the living biosphere was, was really integrated in, in the climate discussions. But it didn't enter in a formal way into the final declaration mm. or, or into the, let's say, at the heart of the rule book, even though every NDC has, of course, the land use, um, parts in in its uh, in its let's say accountability scheme but still the the job of getting uh, credit schemes and markets mm -hmm. and and investments to really i mean to to just just take agriculture mm -hmm. so we are now obliged basically to set out that over the next 30 years to have an agricultural revolution to transition from a carbon emitting to a carbon sequestering global mm -hmm. food system every farmer in the world becoming basically carbon managers. Yeah. How will that happen without economic incentives? It will be impossible. It will require some form of, of um, yeah, economic mechanism to make that possible and, and for large and small scale farmers in the global south and in the north. So, yeah, I think we are, we are there really on, a, on, on, a, on a, something that is not properly it's not discussed in that yeah. economic uh, policy terms in, in the climate negotiations so far. We would embrace that. Uh, one of my observations from uh, Glasgow was uh, the largest presence of finance, both private finance and public finance, finance ministers, central bank governors, I have ever seen in a COP. And that gives me hope that we are now going to put all these econo e economists and financiers hands on deck uh, and then turn the uh, incentives in the direction they have to, uh, to go. Uh, I want to thank you, Johan. This, this was fantastic. You always have an open door uh, whenever you have time uh, for us uh, to continue this conversation. Uh, my gratitude, gratitude to you and of course, uh, my gratitude to those who organized this discussion and to those who are with us uh, for the event. My next uh, piece of work is to pass the floor back to Jerry to close the, uh, to close this session. From me, Johan, thank you. Thank you so much.
So thank you uh, very much, Kristalina, uh, and thank you, Johan, for really a very inspiring conversation. I learned from this session that, yes, there may be a long road ahead of us, but it's clear that addressing climate change is not an option. It's a critical necessity for humanity. We, all of us, individuals, institutions, governments, private sector, and the entire world must pick up the global momentum afforded by COP26 to push ahead in the fight against climate change. So thank you, Louis-Marc Ducharme, the fantastic head of our statistics department here at the fund. Thanks to his great team who have uh, put this event together. Thanks again to our managing director, uh, Kristalina. Johan, thanks to you for doing this today and for all that you do. And thanks to all of you who joined us uh, today for this wonderful close to our amazing uh, statistics forum. Stay safe, stay well, everyone. See you all soon. Bye-bye.